Dreaming of a better sleep? Tossing and turning is not your destiny. And Ollie is here to help. Ollie invites you to sink into sweet, sweet slumber to improve your mental and physical health and overall wellness. More than just melatonin, Ollie's ingredients help you unwind your mind for a delightfully dreamy drift off. Sleep is on the way at Ollie.com. That's O L L Y.com. Spring is here and signs of abundant new life are everywhere. It's a time when most of us feel renewed and optimistic. But experts say this season also comes with a shocking statistic. During the month of April, more people take their own lives than any other time of year. The myth that suicide rates reach their peak during the holidays is just that, a myth. Here's another one. Every suicide death is preventable. In fact, no matter how well-intentioned, alert, and diligent people's efforts may be, there's no way of preventing all suicides from occurring, as stated by the Nevada Division of Public and Behavioral Health Office of Suicide Prevention. We strive for 100% suicide prevention, but people are complex. Hence, suicide prevention is equally complex. We don't know always those signs. We aren't always aware of those signs, but also... Not every person with thoughts of suicide shows us a sign. They might protect their loved ones and family from that. They might be showing someone else a sign. And it's quite possible there are no signs. I do believe that is rare. Most people do show some indication that they're struggling and having thoughts of suicide or struggling with other mental health concerns. That's Misty Von Allen, Suicide Prevention Coordinator with the State of Nevada in the Division of Public and Behavioral Health. She says the notion that all suicides can be prevented is hurtful and inaccurate. In 2022, the CDC recorded almost 50,000 deaths by suicide in the U.S., so it's an important distinction to make, especially for suicide loss survivors. Yes, suicide prevention is a great thing, and I'm glad to see the new hotline number and all of the good work that American Foundation for Suicide Prevention is doing. I would argue that not all suicides are preventable. And perhaps I say that because my daughter's wasn't and I wasn't able to. So maybe I'm being defensive about it, but I've talked to many other parents who bristle at the idea. That's Eileen Vorbach Collins, author of Love in the Archives, a patchwork of true stories about suicide loss. Her daughter Lydia took her own life 23 years ago. Lydia was 15 years old. Certainly, my daughter had mental health issues and had her own clinical diagnoses and was hospitalized. And it wasn't that I didn't see what we like to call the signs. And that's one of the issues I have with the whole idea of getting on the prevention bandwagon. Certainly, we all want to see suicide prevention, and I'm certain that it does work to a degree. It's when I hear that all suicides are preventable that it makes me bristle because they are not. You know, I worked in mental health. I knew the signs. My daughter exhibited many of them, was hospitalized, had a therapist, was medicated for a while. But at some point, you cannot watch a child 24 hours a day. As a parent, Colin suffered the common stigma of shame and guilt after Lydia's death. Had she done enough to protect her daughter? Could she have prevented Lydia's suicide? What kind of parent could I have been? And I think that's what prompted me to write the book, is that I went for years feeling such horrific guilt. And it comes with the territory. It's what people feel. You know, you're gifted with this child and your job is to protect that child and raise that child. And when it turns out that they take their own lives, you just look back at everything you've ever done or said and wonder what could I have done differently. Collins sought help from other suicide loss survivors through various support groups. If it hadn't been for some of these survivor groups. I don't know how I would have managed. I absolutely needed to find other people who had gone through this. I have so many people in my life because of these support groups who have felt the same. And I'm able to look at them and say, no, this wasn't your fault. 
you know, you did what you could do. And then finally, being able to tell myself that. In addition to the myth of prevention, Colin says another misleading idea is that suicide is always a selfish act. I never thought of it that way. I thought of it as she tried so hard. And when I read her journals, when I read her journals, she fought it for a long time, as young as she was. And I hear this from many other parents. It's not like they did this to hurt us. It's They did it because they couldn't take the pain anymore. Rick Strait is the Substance Use Division Director and Suicide Prevention Coordinator for the Community Counseling Center in Southeast Missouri. He's also a suicide attempt survivor. I struggled with depression my whole life growing up as a child. Didn't know it was depression at the time. And then I lost my brother in a car accident. And that took that grief, the spiral, the depression to the point that I felt completely alone. In retrospect, I know I wasn't alone. I had parents that were also hurting But I felt like I had to not let them know I was hurting. That way I could be supportive of them. I had a wife at the time and I had a newborn baby. And I was in the military at the time. So I had a lot of friends that are in my squadron that I, you know, so I knew, like looking back, I had so many people in my corner, but I just felt like I wasn't. I felt like it was just me. Fortunately, Strait's mom interrupted his attempt. Though he was initially angry, Strait quickly realized how grateful he was to be alive. Yes, I was glad, but I still struggle with depression and suicidal thoughts for many, many more years. But after the attempt, though, I had kind of made the promise to myself that I wouldn't attempt again because I realized how it was going to impact my wife at the time. And so I tried to make that promise to myself that it would never happen again. Strait says he eventually learned how to talk about his feelings, though it took a long time to be comfortable with. And when he met with other suicide attempt survivors, he realized that so many more people struggle with these thoughts than just him. Because that was one of the worst feelings about when I was having thoughts of suicide is I really thought that nobody else would ever understand that there's nobody else that's ever been through this. And so as I learned over the years that there are so many people have been through this, so many people have lost people to suicide, so many people have made attempts and lived, and then so many people are struggling with those thoughts and never act on them. And so even though I'm not glad that they struggled also, it was kind of a lightning effect for me when I realized okay, I'm not alone. This isn't some just messed up Rick thing. This is, this happens. And, you know, the more I learn and how often it happens, it has helped me feel kind of normal. And then eventually I got some counseling and some help to get through the depression. Today, Strait is doing well, but he still has bad days. The difference is that he talks about his feelings with his family and friends to let them know when he's struggling. We don't have to spend a whole bunch of time dwelling on it, but it keeps those thoughts from festering and becoming more intense. Von Allen says many people live with ongoing thoughts of suicide on a daily basis. Thankfully, a lot of them have found successful coping strategies. There are many people with persistent thoughts of suicide, and they live and work with us and keep themselves safe. When their thoughts start to escalate towards suicide, they have a safety plan that they need to work. And that could be reaching out to a hotline. It could be walking the dog. It could be talking to your support system. They manage those thoughts with individual safety plans, incredible support systems, and often a routine of well-being and wellness that helps de-escalate those thoughts and bring those thoughts back down under balance. Research shows that suicide attempts are often impulsive. A person might deliberate for five minutes or less after having suicidal thoughts before taking action. It is one of the most preventable forms of death. It is. But again, we aren't always given the gift of time and those signs within that time. There are certain people who might have an event occur that activates thoughts of suicide and lethal means are readily accessible. One of the most proven prevention strategies we can implement is giving that person with thoughts of suicide space and time away from that lethal means, be it medication, be it a firearm. We give them space and time. Often they can deescalate. They can reach out for help or someone can intervene. So that's really a crucial element here, but we don't always get that opportunity. And as suicide rates continue to rise, Von Allen says that prevention is crucial. However, there's always more to learn, especially from people like Strait. Those who survive their own attempts of suicide teach us how to be better at the work we do with prevention. Under our best efforts and our most diligent work, we can still lose someone that we're trying to help. But the better we get, the stronger our safety net will become. 
If anyone listening to this program is feeling depressed or having suicidal thoughts, you can dial or text 988 from anywhere in the country. Sometimes just talking to somebody that you know that cares and can help listen, and sometimes it can be enough on its own. And they get a trained person that can ask them some questions and just be there for a conversation. And then most states also have, you know, walk-in mental health clinics as well. I know in Missouri, every county has a Department of Mental Health funded place where they, people can walk in and they can talk to somebody every day, any day. And if someone you know is depressed or has shared that they've been having suicidal thoughts, Strait says it's important to be a listening ear for them. If we can have compassion and listening and ask some questions and then just be present, even if we know it's a suicidal crisis or not. So let's say there is a teenager that brings that to them, just being there and being in that moment. And well, tell me what's going on. And then truly listening. And as a parent myself, it's hard not to try to fix right away. We want to go into problem solve and tell them all the things that are going right. Just listen and kind of shut that parent mode off for a second and just, you know, the writing reflects and just listen. I think that's one of the most powerful things we can do, whether it be any type of mental health thing, whether it be just a bad day and no suicidal crisis or somebody that's having suicidal thoughts. If we can just take a few minutes and just truly listen to what they're saying and not jump to conclusions. Alan's book, Love in the Archives, a patchwork of true stories about suicide loss, is available now online and wherever books are sold. You can learn more about suicide prevention and all of our guests on our website, radiohealthjournal.org. For more behind the scenes, follow Radio Health Journal on Facebook, Instagram, and X. Our writer-producer this week is Polly Hansen. Our lead producer is Kristen Farah. I'm Elizabeth Westfield. Coming up next week on Radio Health Journal. I think people get pretty desperate when they're having trouble sleeping. And so people are looking for answers and quick fixes and ways to improve their sleep in a very simple way. How to get your sleep back on track. But first, the dangers of colon cancer appearing in younger adults. When a patient is diagnosed at a younger age with cancer, unfortunately, they are more likely to have advanced cancer. All that and more on Radio Health Journal. I'm Greg Johnson, host of Radio Health Journal. If you enjoy listening to Radio Health Journal, you'll also like our sister show, Viewpoints, which covers a wide array of topics from education to history to the environment. Here's a preview of what they're covering this week on Viewpoints. What we're seeing now is that people from all walks of life, people who had jobs, who had homes, who had families, are now going unclaimed. The growing epidemic of unclaimed bodies in America. Then... I have a list of 45 ingredients, and 41 of those were functionally extinct. Did the fruits and vegetables of our ancestors actually taste better? These food historians have no doubt. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in-depth this week on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. Listen to Viewpoints Radio on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you for joining us this week and every week as we break down the science stories you need to know. You can find all of our past segments and guests on our website, radiohealthjournal.org, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and X for daily content. And tune in next week for another edition of Radio Health Journal. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders, from ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities. CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.